Welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage here in San Francisco for Annie Scales Race Summit. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Savannah Peterson. We're breaking down all the action here where all the top engineers are here, really kind of setting the agenda for the future of machine learning, generative AI, the platforms that are going to power the next generation. We've got Ji Hao here, he's the Director of Engineering of AI and Model Infrastructure at Uber. We know they are doing some really good stuff. They're one of the organizations at the forefront of AI. They have powerful AI and ML platforms. They use Ray, their core product at any scale, as, as the core AI engine. Uh, Jithal, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thank you. Okay, so you guys, first of all, are featured all the time on SiliconANGLE and theCUBE. Uh, Uber's infrastructure team, their engineering team, phenomenal work. The app, people, places, and things. Really a state of the art, in my opinion, in our opinion, the research team of what the platform of the future is going to be. So you guys are a good proxy for all the cool engineering work. So building an AI platform is hard. Uh, as you're here at Ray Summit, obviously the Ray is killer product for any scale. They're scaling, a lot more practitioners here, open source, they had users, the growth of the product, just overall good stuff for the company. What's it like to build an AI platform? What are some of the engineering things you're looking at? What's the core problem you're solving? Thank you. Uh, so, we have been doing AI platform for more than eight years. We have this amazing platform called Michelangelo, which the lineage actually started in 2016. We were one of the earliest teams which productionized the concept of feature store and they bring feature store to production. And later, as the rest of the world starting to revolutionize machine learning from linear regression decision tree into deep learning, we started to recognize the challenges of our older stack. It works well by running XGBoost on top of Spark ML and wiring everything together using Spark transformers. But deep learning really calls easy access to GPUs, which brings in unprecedented computation power to the world the workflow. The workflow also calls for very easy access of distributed Python computation. All the deep learning custom code are written in Python. And we really hit the nail on the spot of offering the great flexibility and, uh, and uh, of the easy access to Python code and uh, great access to GPUs across the life cycle of the workload. That is why we adopted a, re a few years ago and we, the journey just go amazingly from there. All right, so explain to me the, um, what your life was like before Ray and then after Ray. And if you weren't using Ray today, what were some of the things that you have to deal with? What, take us through that progression. Thank you, yeah. Before we, we were operating distributed Spark clusters that tries to run the, uh, machine learning model training on inside. Um, but it's very difficult to retrofit those things to run on a GPU native cluster, managing the life cycle of the workload. And it's very difficult to fully containerize everything. Uber loved the containers. And the fun fact, I was one of the first engineers building containers for Uber back to 2014. It's almost a decade of history <laughs> with the containers. So these containers can provide the best isolation of the workload and allow us to utilize the GPUs and uh, run the heterogeneous computation cluster in the most main maintainable and scalable way. So we, with Ray, we are able to run, these run, run many clusters. I believe we are doing more than 20,000 model training jobs every month on our clusters and in our data centers. And this would not be possible without Ray. What are some of the things that, that does that enable you to do better? I mean, obviously, great value. Mm -hmm. What does that enable you guys to do now? It allows us to actually evolve the platform before generative AI into the generative AI. We actually published a blog post a, lot, a few months ago called Machine Learning Platform from Predictive ML to Generative ML. We are so lucky that we end up using one platform and like keep extending it and solving skills that we can't even imagine in the past. These days, our model is often even bigger than the data set we used to solve. But we are able to keep extending the platform and coming up with incremental innovations. And we keep supporting the, the users to evolve and allow them to expand their workload by order of magnitude directly. They yeah. don't even are talking about 50%, 80% yeah. <laughs> increase. They come to us and say, I want to 10x my model. I want to 100x my model. These 
How do I do that? We are happy to say our infrastructure stays on the frontier and allow yeah. this scalability problem to be mostly solved. So they can keep yeah. using the well laid path and go from there. Yeah, first of all, I love the name AnyScale. AnyScale is scaling. Everybody tweet about that because it's kind of play on words. But you're really getting at setting the table for what could be unlimited upside on engineering, the multiple step function advantages. Um, what's the coolest thing that you've done that you could share um, that's come from that? Because now that you've got the freedom to scale, what pops out? What kind of benefit? Share some cool things. I think one of the cool things we actually managed to solve is how to elastically sharing resources in a Kubernetes cluster. We remove we all the GPU trainings into Kubernetes and we run 100% of the pump of Ray and we operate the cluster. Teams come to us with uh, requesting reserved capacities in the cluster, but we actually have an amazing mechanism to allow teams to borrow resources from between each other when they are yeah. not running their yeah. training job at this yeah. moment. <laughs> this actually allows us to satisfy the training needs a much smaller sum yeah. of the yeah. GPU cars than what teams believe they do. And this saved a lot of infrastructure costs for Uber. So we can survive, we can sustain the business growth from here. Talk about the cost side of it, because obviously everyone goes crazy over the cost of GPUs. I heard a, a stat today, uh, this morning, from someone in the hallway that said they know a company that their friend works at. It's always a friend that works there. They're going to spend 10 billion just this year on GPUs. Obviously they might work at Meta, we, who knows, maybe even Uber. But, there's a huge cost on the hardware, but there's also the cost of the infrastructure. What are some of those cost points that you guys want to stay ahead of to create that value, to take, take the innovation um, deliverable to be faster than the cost increase? That is a great question. I think my, my personal motto and something I hope my team can do for Uber is, making sure the cost of machine learning grows slower <laughs> than the value we create for our company. So we can sustainably doing this next couple of years. Yeah. When we get to the concrete cost, everybody knows GPUs are not cheap. I don't have to recite <laughs> the numbers from public cloud providers. But I think we want to unlock innovation. Everything, if we look at the things in time trend, things will get cheaper by themselves, and they'll have these amazing peers in the industry, <laughs> including any skill people, who keeps, yeah. keeps coming up with the great news of something is 10x cheaper, 50, 90% yeah. cheaper than what is six, six or 12 months ago. So what you do is helping people to launch so they unlock the basis gains fast, making sure we understand the cost, making sure we periodically revisit this, and as an infrastructure provider and platform provider, keep working close with the stakeholder and the innovation innovators so that we bring down yeah. the cost while they gradually roll out the features for the rest of the world. Yeah, and you guys just do a lot of work over there. I can't reiterate enough how impressed you guys are on the platform. It really is, to me, the future. Because all the things you'd mentioned, Kubernetes, all these kind of concepts of borrowing resources, loading them around. It reminds me of my old operating system days where you got to look at the system architecture. Yes. Um, it's a systems play, there's costs involved in the inherent costs in, in people the resources, the cost, the GPUs, and whatnot. So, so that's one uh, angle I want to get your thoughts on. And then two, the data sets are emerging, um, where you have multimodal. Mm -hmm. Again, that combined with the fact that you guys are dealing with multiple kind of third party. You got drivers, you got, you got eats, you got cars, you got, I mean, all kinds of different systems, all running real time. So you get the systems, yeah. opportunity, mm -hmm. challenge and opportunity, and then the multimodal data. What's your thoughts around that? Share your insight. So really excellent about um, unstructured data and the multimodal data. Our team's doing computer, Uber, Uber team doing computer vision, natural language processing, and uh, a hybrid of unstructured and structured data. They have no problem to use it directly. When we get to tabular data, the way we handle is we create abstractions for ourselves, so we convert some of the tabular data into unstructured parquet files, and making sure we process these things under as intermediate representations, so that we hide all this complexity from our users. So this is, allows we hash, operate one shared ML platform and solve both the tabular data that is pretty much existed before Uber even think about ML platform, before 2014, <laughs> yeah. and all the up rising use cases of computer vision, yeah. video, audio, all those new multimodal cases, and allowed us to gracefully enter the generative era because <laughs> Gen AI is all about text. Yeah, yeah, you guys are definitely were in good position for the Gen AI. I like your talk about predictive and Gen AI, but 
is predictive going away or that still hangs around and still functional? Because in some cases, they work together. There's use cases for predictive and there's use cases for generative. How do you guys look at that dynamic? I don't think they're going away anytime soon. There are special corners of machine learning and subdomains which a smaller model is doing just the fine. And the smaller models allow them to be inferenced extremely fast. It's less about cost, but more about the latency. We are very committed to reduce the latency as much as we can from, so that the Uber app remains, they deliver the best user experience. These small models are doing just the fine there. So I think some of there are some development of borrowing new research develop, new research takeaways on the smaller model and they scale up. But I think in the foreseeable future, predictive and smaller model will just be there. You know, I want to get your thoughts because you're, you're in the engine room, you're like making all the horsepower work, all the machine learning scale. Um, what's right around the corner in the industry right now is the, on the app side is the agentic systems. Mm -hmm. Okay, as you look at agents, you say, okay, I get that, that makes a lot of sense. Retrofit workloads end to end with agents. How do you view that agent opportunity? Because if you get the work done at the data layer, infrastructure layer, the agents is the next logical piece because you got the data management, data is unstructured, semi-structured, structured, you guys look at that as data, you manage that well. Now agents come in. Mm -hmm. Where do you see that playing on the ops side, engineering ops, and then also how does that uh, render itself in the app? Any, any commentary there? Yes, I think, I personally think multi-agent is definitely one of the direction that we need to, we need to use to solve the most open-ended and the challenging problems on the JI aspect. My takeaway is that it's pretty easy to build a first prototype of J using JAI and get something out, get something out. The challenges come from not only shipping the high quality and high accuracy of the application, but giving the developers a wild path so they can keep polishing and improving their qualities as, as with every quarter because nothing stays <laughs> immutable. For companies like Uber, once we launch something, we need to stay committed to the quality and keep increasing it. Yeah. So I think as things are getting more complicated and advanced, a lot of the use cases will need have a need of multi-agent. And that's where I believe the future of the JAI will look like. Well, since you brought it up, I want to just, if you don't mind asking you about, um, you mentioned uh, cost, which we talked about. You know, in machine learning uh, and AI, one of the topics that comes up a lot is, latency, which you, you guys are perfecting. Low latency, obviously you got to get that as fast as possible. But recency and relevance of data mm -hmm. is a technical problem. How do you view that? How do your engineers view their, that managing that the quality of the data? Because you can train content and train data, multimodal or, or language, but then you got to figure out, okay, what's relevant now and recent? Yeah, I think this is where the productionization of ML platform goes beyond the model. There's also data aspect that needs to be productionization. There's a near real-time features. Michelangelo has internal support of a lot of near real-time features using various real-time technologies like Flink uh, and uh, Kafka. And we also starting to, we also in the process of productionization, a near real-time handling for the generative AI workloads. For example, near real, uh, allow people to regularly update their imbe embedding spaces, yeah. vector database, all these things. Yeah. The good thing is a lot of patterns are similar of our pre-gen AI world, so we get to move a lot of our learnings from that area and apply them in the new world. Yeah. This is where a, a set of engineers who have working all these years, the, uh, we benefit from the expertise out of this. Okay, so we're here at the Ray Summit, so any scales growing company, obviously they're doing well, they got a new CEO, Founders out there getting back in on, on the product side, which is great news to see. Um, it's always hard to run a company as a founder, um, so I can see that. How would you describe their platform? For the folks watching, um, what category is it in? How would you describe it? Why is it awesome? What's your experience with the platform? So Uber has been mostly in the open source part of the RE, but we do love the open source version because it offers very easy, like I said, very easy distributed Python environment. The interactive experience with the notebooks in the RIG cluster just proves this, it proves its value a lot by helping people to stay, 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 help them to debug their training workload and have a deep understanding inside that RIG cluster. We love these aspects. 
And uh, we just started looking at the platform offering, so I think as time goes, we'll have more yeah. learnings about that. Yeah. What's next for Uber? Have you had to uh, talk about the engineering priorities around Uber, what you guys are working on? Again, people, places, and things. You guys solving a lot of platform problems. And again, shout out to you guys. I think you were the first data lake implementer of data lakes, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Moved from Columnar Store and kind of bring, re, redoing the streaming architecture. You guys have done a lot of work on that. Now you're here, what's next for you guys? I would say number one, Uber is entering a hybrid cloud setup. So, and evolving, our, evolving the data lake, especially the ML aspect of the data lake in the multi-cloud, multi-region, multi-provider environment is going to be an interesting challenge. The second is again, going back to efficiency. Keeps driving up, driving up the efficiency, driving down the cost and removing all the frictions for our users. Some of the advanced users has to break the highest level of traction to use a lower level offering for their early prototypes. We understand this is the maintenance cost <laughs> for fast yeah. innovation, yeah. but you want to gradually move them back to highest level of traction yeah. so that they can, they can reduce their frictions and we can support more use cases with our engineers. The last but not least, we are always thinking about open source. Yeah. We want to open source the great innovations, those elastic resource sharing yeah. stuff, some of the tools we develop for responsible AI, like explainability on top of Ray, some of the workflow stuff, and we want to always look, look around about the great innovations in open source and observe them in our platform. Well, Savannah and I and Rob Stretchy will be at KubeCon, so we'd love you to come in and share that open source with the KubeCon CNCF. I know they would love that. Uh, again, that's orchestrating a lot of value there. Um, love having you guys on theCUBE. Your content's phenomenal. Again, you guys are at the forefront of the AI wave. My final question for you would be, for the folks that are trying to start thinking about, okay, have the old IT environment, um, the classic enterprise are realizing it, the, the boardrooms are saying, hey engineers, let's get engineering some founda new foundational sets of services. Okay, so you got a back end revolution happening around Gen AI, merging predictive with Gen AI, but the front end's also changing. I've never seen this in my career where both front end and back end, you got to do both. You got to get the workflow and the process nailed down and get the back end. Mm -hmm. What's your advice for folks who are looking at building AI platforms? What should they be thinking about? What are some best practices from your experience with your team and your work that they could take to heart on as they look at the 20 mile stair for the future? What should they do? My number of advice is always embrace open source, embrace openness. I was at this tech advisory with IDSCO yesterday. The challenges and pain points I've ever seen is strikingly similar. <laughs> we are all trying to solve a set of similar yeah. problems at different companies. So open source will speed up everybody's, everybody's journey and solving these things yeah. faster. And you, we, try, we will avoid the mistakes of solving something by ourselves. Simply not, not yeah. knowing an alternative exists. My second advice is meet where your users are. Try to, think, try to think about how they do things, what's most natural to them. These days it's probably going to be Python, Pandas, APIs, analytical uh, notebooks. Try to meet where they are and offer something that they can learn even before joining your company. That maximizing their productivity. Yeah. Machine learning engineers are expensive to hire, <laughs> very hard to hire. So let's maximize their productivity on day one. Well, there's a lot of people who want to make some good bank and be an engineer like you. What would be the, your advice for folks watching that are at the university right now? I mean, because right now, computer science curriculum is rapidly, just in the past four years, adopting and trying to stay on that rocket ship. You know, there's a lot of young people watching, maybe work for Uber or another company. What should they be thinking about if they're at university, if they're a Python developer, or have natural engineering skills? What would be advice for those people? I think, I think, I would suggest the students to find a good balance between chasing the latest development and also pay some attention to the computer science fundamentals. The fundamentals are still there. I think this generation of AI is really enabled by the best system engineers that has who have got their expertise before Gen AI was even a concept. Yeah. So, so system, students, systems thinking. Yes, systems thinking. Operating systems, compiler design, is there, is there a certain kind distrib of lane? Distrib distributed systems, distributed system, system designs, all the fundamentals of what computer science students are, should be learning their <laughs> four years, and uh, or six years if we're with a master's As I always say in the QG, I wish I was 25 again. If you're in computer science or, or even any engineering field, there's a huge amount of systems opportunity to build these platforms. Yes. 
Um, and so congratulations on your uh, success and thank you for sharing your, your insight with theCUBE community, appreciate you. Thank you. All right, I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE here in San Francisco for Ray Summit with Savannah Peterson, bringing you all the live action from the floor here at Ray Summit, AnyScale, fast growing company, great platform, a lot of tier one engineering users building AI platforms, companies like Apple, Uber, and you know, the biggest names with the biggest staffs changing the future here in San Francisco. Thanks for watching.